Hi, hello, and welcome back to the program analysis course. This is the lecture on random testing and fuzzing, and this is part three of this lecture, where we'll, we will look into um, a form of random testing called gray box fuzzing. Um, and in particular, we will look into a tool called AFL, which implements many of these ideas into a practically tool that is actually widely used in industry and also academia. Most of what I'm saying is based on um, a description of this AFL tool that you can find here. So if you want to know some more details, um, please look it up there. And of course, you can also try out the tool. So it's very easy to actually get hands on experience um, with gray box fuzzing. Let's start by defining what gray box fuzzing actually is. So it's a form of fuzzing where you want to guide the generation of new inputs toward a specific goal. And of course, if you have a specific goal in mind, you need some way to measure whether you're actually making progress towards that goal. And in the case of gray box fuzzing, this is done through some lightweight program analysis, which tells you something about what is happening inside the program. And this is then used as guidance to tell you whether you're getting closer to your goal. So for example, this goal could be to increase the coverage of the program and try to cover more and more lines or basic blocks in the program. Um, it's a lightweight program analysis because it's not really analyzing all the details of what's happening in the execution. It's, for example, not looking at the different conditions that triggered um, the program to take a particular path, but it's only something um, like coverage that can be measured with re re yeah, reasonable overhead, relatively low overhead, and still give some information about whether you're getting closer to the goal that um, the fuzzer has. Now, given this overall idea, gray box fuzzing um, typically consists of three steps. The first one is to randomly generate some inputs, um, where basically some random input is, is created and then given to the program. Now, while the program is executing, um, the fuzzer gets some feedback from the test execution. So for example, if the goal is to increase coverage, then this feedback would be what code is actually covered. Do we maybe cover some new code? And this tells us uh, which of the generated inputs are actually useful in the sense of getting closer towards the goal. And then the third step is to mutate these inputs in a more or less random way, but to focus on those inputs that have actually been good in terms of getting closer to our overall goal. For example, um, the fuzzer would mutate only those inputs that have covered new code, hoping that if you have covered some new code, then maybe there's some more code to be covered on top of that if you mutate the inputs a little bit. This overall idea of gray box fuzzing could be implemented in many different ways, and actually there are many different implementations. Here in the lecture, we'll focus mostly on a tool called American Fuzzy Lop. American Fuzzy Lop is also the name of a rabbit breed, which you can see here. Um, it's a very cute rabbit, I know, but this is actually not what the lecture is going to be about, because after all, it's a lecture on program analysis. But instead, we're going to talk about American Fuzzy Lop as a simple yet effective fuzzing tool. It's abbreviated AFL, so if you just Google for AFL and fuzzing, um, you should find the tool and you can actually play around with it. It's a tool that targets um, C and C++ programs, and the inputs um, in this case are, for example, files that are read by this program, or more broadly, all the inputs that the program as a whole is taking. So it's typically used to fuzz entire programs. Um, you could adapt it also to fuzz, for example, individual functions, but the most common use case is um, to fuzz entire programs, and these programs are typically written in C and C++. AFL is widely used in industry, um, so it um, has been supported by Google for a couple of years now, and um, Google and also other companies are using it to find a lot of security-related bugs. Um, in particular, they're also using it to find a lot of bugs in open source software, such as OpenSSL, PHP, Firefox, and many, many others. And by now, AFL has found hundreds of security critical bugs in these programs, um, which have probably prevented um, a lot of um, yeah, attacks that otherwise could have happened. I'll now give you an overview of the AFL tool, and then we look into individual components of the tool separately. So the core concept of this tool is that there is a queue of test inputs, which holds a set of test inputs that have already been used and which will then be used to um, generate new inputs. To initialize this queue, what is often done is that there's some set of seed inputs, which you can think of as um, a small set of realistic inputs that a human provides 
knowing that these are inputs that are typically used to exercise the program under test. And these seed inputs will actually help the fuzzer to more quickly get into um, yeah, interesting parts of the program. Because if you start with completely random inputs, then it'll take a while until um, the fuzzer actually finds out how to bypass simple um, sanity checks that may be at the very beginning of the program. Whereas if you start with realistic seed inputs, um, you easily bypass these sanity checks and can, can then try to cover more code deep inside the program under test. Now, given um, this queue of test inputs, there's a main loop that is um, executed over and over again until the fuzzer runs out of time. And that starts by um, choosing one of the inputs in the queue to um, use next. And there are different ways how this could be done. So let's assume we are taking some uh, test input T here. And then what happens is that this input is mutated meaning that um, a different variant of this input is generated. And actually this is done not only once, but uh, multiple times. So we are generating multiple different test inputs, um, T prime and T double prime and so on from this one input. And now each of these inputs is used to exercise the program. And um, by doing this, we can get some feedback from the execution of the program, which we can then use to determine whether this input is actually interesting. Now, what does interesting mean? Well, we'll see what it means. It's basically based on the coverage uh, and there's some more tricks involved here. And then if it is not interesting, then um, we are discarding this input. So if the answer here is no, then it's just discarded and we will never look at this input again. Whereas if the answer is yes, then this is some input which we will put into our queue So that the queue then has more inputs. And this loop continues over and over. So it's repeatedly mutating inputs that have been found to be interesting um, until it has, well, either th theoretically covered all code, but in practice that rarely happens, or until there's a timeout and the user decides that this was enough fuzzing. Before looking into some of these components in more detail, let me get back to one of the core concepts of program analysis that we have already um, looked at earlier in this lecture, and that's the idea of a control flow graph. So just to uh, refresh your memories, the control flow graph is a graph representation of the code where um, the different nodes correspond to statements uh, in, the, in the program and the edges tell you in which order these statements may be executed one after another. Um, now, in the control flow graphs that we have looked at so far, every statement was um, represented as one node. What I want to do now is show a variant of this um, idea of a control flow graph where we have so-called basic blocks, which are groups of statements that are always executed together. So as, an, as a simple example, let's consider a program where we have some statement A. This could be any single statement. I'm not really um, writing down the detailed statements here. Then we have some check, for example, uh, we could check whether x is larger than 3. And then in the then branch, um, we may have two statements b and c. And let's say we also have an else branch where we have a statement d. And then once this if statement is over, there are two more statements e and f that are executed afterwards, no matter which of the two branches we've taken. So the way we have drawn the control flow graphs so far would look as follows. Um, we would have one for this statement A, then we would have another node for this check that X is larger than three. And this node will have two outgoing edges, one for statement B followed by statement C and one for statement D. And then no matter which of these two branches we take, we'll at the end reach the statement E, which is then followed by statement F. Now this is what we've done so far. If you want to use basic blocks, the idea is that all nodes that are definitely executed together because there's no um, branching um, statement in between will be merged into a single node. So let me just write down this, this idea here. So a basic block is essentially a sequence 
of operations or statements that is always executed together. And the reason why this happens is because there's no um, branch in between. All right, so doing this for um, our simple example here, we would get just a single basic block for um, statement A and the check that X is larger than three, because actually this check is always executed after A, simply because there's no other branch in between. And then we would have two outgoing edges, similar to um, the other representation, but now B and C would be in the same node, um, simply because they are always executed together again, so there's nothing in between, and when B is executed, we know for sure that C will follow afterwards. And on the other hand, we have um, the single statement D, which has a basic block on its own. And then after the if statement, um, we have these two st statements, E and F. And again, because they are definitely executed together, because F always follows after E, they will again be put into the same basic block. So our control flow graph, if you use this idea of basic blocks, um, will look like this. And in this case, we have basically these four basic blocks here which still represent exactly the same flow of control, just with fewer nodes. So now that you know what basic blocks are, let's get back to AFL and let's have a look at what kind of feedback AFL is actually using. So the main feedback it's using is coverage. So the goal of AFL is to cover as much code as possible. Now when I say coverage, I could mean different things because actually there are a lot of different coverage metrics that people are using. So sometimes when people say coverage, they actually mean line coverage. Sometimes they mean statement coverage, which is not necessarily the same because some statements may span multiple lines and um, on a single line, you could also have multiple statements. Sometimes people mean branch coverage um, and sometimes people mean path coverage, which looks at entire paths through the program and tries to cover as many as possible of those. So one lesson learned here is whenever someone says coverage, you should ask what kind of coverage. And what I actually mean here when I say coverage is branch coverage. And specifically what I mean is branch coverage where the branches are um, the, the edges between the nodes in a control flow graph. So these are branches between basic blocks. So why is this the coverage metric that AFL is using? Well, the reason is that um, just reaching a code location may not be enough to trigger a bug. But sometimes the state that brings you to that code to a particular code location also matters. If it would just look at, say, statement or line coverage, then it would basically try to reach every code location once, but it wouldn't really reach it um, in, um, in, in different states. And by looking at branch coverage, AFL tries to um, also uh, incorporate the state that the program has when reaching a particular location into this coverage metric. Now, a more extreme or more precise way of measuring coverage would be, for example, path coverage. But this would um, basically mean that there are infinitely many paths in the program. And also tracking all the different paths would be much more expensive than just tracking the edges in the control flow graph. So in a sense, branch coverage is a compromise between um, the two um, um, yeah, factors that always um, determine um, this kind of analysis, namely the effort that is spent on measuring the coverage. So as we'll see, you can measure branch coverage in a relatively lightweight way. And on the other hand, the, the benefit that you get from it, so the guidance that this information um, actually provides to the fuzzer, and it turns out branch coverage is a nice sweet spot between um, a, a more precise measurement and, um, uh, yeah, and a less precise measurement, like for example, just line coverage. As an example, let's just consider a few um, uh, executions of some program. And in this um, uh, example, I just use letters A, B, C, D to refer to basic blocks. So what we'll see here is, um, on the one hand, the sequence of basic blocks that are, um, that are executed. And then on the other side, of this little table, we'll see the, um, the edges or the branches that are 
that are covered. And these branches um, correspond to edges in the control flow graph. So let's say um, we have a sequence A, B, C, D, and E. Then um, we would have um, multiple branches covered here, namely AB, which is the edge from node A to node B, BC, CD, and DE. And as another example, which is here to show you that um, covering the same nodes may lead to different branches that are executing. Let's consider this sequence where AB is the same as before, but now we are first executing block D and then executing block C followed by block E. So this may actually happen if you have some kind of um, loop and, um, and maybe an if in a program. And now if you would just look at um, say basic block coverage or statement coverage, then um, these two executions that we see here would look exactly the same because they are covering the same basic blocks and hence also the same statements and same lines. But if you look at the branches that are covered, we actually see a difference because now we have A, B and B, D, which is something we haven't covered before. And also D, C is a branch that we haven't covered before and the same um, for C, E. So what this um, these two simple examples show is that um, by looking at branch coverage, we get significantly more information than if we would just look at simple block or simple line or simple statement coverage. So now that you know conceptually what AFL wants to measure, let's have a look at how this coverage measurement is actually implemented. So here are three lines that essentially show how AFL measures coverage. And these are actually three pretty nice lines of code because on a, um, on, yeah, with just three lines, they measure uh, coverage in a surprisingly efficient way. So these three lines are um, added to the program at every branching point. So AFL is instrumenting the program by adding these three lines at every point in the program where you have a branch. Um, this, this code depends on three global variables called current location, um, shared memory, and previous location. And let's now have a look at what they what they do. So the current location um, points to um, the well is a contains a, a unique identifier or at least probabilistically unique identifier for the current source code location. So when AFL is instrumenting the program, it's at compile time generating um, a new random um, constant that it uses as um, the identifier for each location where it's adding some instrumentation code. And the advantage of doing this um, in this randomized way is that it works well for separate compilations. So even if you are compiling two components of your program separately, if you combine them um, through the um, when linking the program, um, this is likely to still work out because they all have just randomly um, generated identifiers for all the branching locations, and therefore there will be um, yeah, a minimum number of um, collisions. The um, second global variable here is this array um, called shared memory, which is um, some globally reachable memory that stores how often every edge was actually covered. So the indexing part here um, of this array is um, the identifier of a particular edge in the control flow graph, so of a particular branch. And we're getting this um, identifier by taking, um, well, by combining the current location and the previous location and by just um, taking bitwise x or um, of these two, which is just combining them um, in, a, in a quick way. And then this identifier for this edge um, is used as an index in the shared memory array. And then we're just incrementing um, the number of times that it has been seen. So initially, um, this, is, um, this is zero for all the edges. And then we, of course, also, as the program is executing, need to somehow update this previous location. And this is done here where the idea is that um, the current location becomes the next previous location. And um, as an additional little trick, it's just um, bit shifted by one here. And this is simply to distinguish between um, a basic block A followed by another basic block B from basic block B followed by basic block A. So because this bitwise X or here um, is symmetric, um, we wouldn't be able to distinguish AB from BA, 
But by just bit shifting um, the previous location by one, um, actually AB looks different from BA, and this means that as a result, um, um, AFL can distinguish between these two edges that otherwise would be indistinguishable. Now in this overview figure of AFL, I was saying that AFL is keeping the inputs that are interesting. And now let's define what interesting really means. Interesting means that an input is detecting or is triggering some new behavior. And the way AFL is uh, detecting whether some new behaviors have been triggered is by looking at the set of edges that are um, covered by the input. And whenever an input triggers a new edge, then AFL says, okay, this is new behavior because it's something that I haven't seen before. Um, there are many different alternative ways how to do this. For example, AFL could also look at entire paths from the beginning of the program to the end of the program and could say whenever a new path is triggered, um, then this would be some new behavior. Um, there are two problems with that. One is that it's significantly more expensive to track because instead of just um, tracking all the different edges in the control flow graph, we would now have to um, keep track of all the different paths, um, which, is, um, which is more expensive. And of course, um, there also is the path explosion problem, which basically means that um, the number of possible paths that you have in a program execution tends to explode when you have multiple um, uh, branches in the program, which you typically have. And in the presence of loops, there are even infinitely many different um, paths. And to avoid all these problems, instead, AFL considers um, an input to trigger new behavior whenever it triggers a new edge in the control flow graph. So let's illustrate this idea again with an example where let's say our first execution looks like this. Um, we start with basic block A, then execute basic block B, then execute basic block C, followed by D and E. Because this is the first, um, this is obviously new. So this is considered um, something we should keep. Um, and yeah, because it's the first execution, this is always the case by definition. Now let's say that AFL is mutating the input, which will lead hopefully to a different um, execution path. And let's say that now we are executing A and B and C again, but then after C, instead of going into D, we now get back to basic block A and then into basic block E. And now if you look at the edges, you'll see that there are some new edges in here. For example, CA is an edge um, that was not covered by the first execution and therefore again, um, this is considered to be something new. So again, this input is kept and then um, one of the inputs that we have in our queue will be modified again. And let's say this leads to a third execution, which now looks um, a little different from the others because it's much longer. So here we have ABC followed by another ABC, maybe because there's a loop around these statements, followed by yet another ABC. Oops. followed by um, D and E. So now this is a very different path from the others because we're executing um, um, some loop apparently that makes us go through statements or basic blocks ABC multiple times. But if you look at the edges that are covered by this, then you'll see that nothing in this third execution is actually a new with respect to um, the first two executions. And AFL will therefore decide that this is not new because now um, we haven't really um, seen any new edge here. So now you might say, well, isn't this really um, a bad idea actually? Because um, if you're um, executing a couple of statements multiple times because we're going repeatedly through a loop, then this might actually lead to new behavior. And uh, yes, you're right. And actually, AFL has a refinement of the previous definition of what new behavior means, which will take care of this example that I've just shown. And this refinement is based on the hit counts of the edges that are executed. So the idea here is that for each edge that is executed, the algorithm not only um, keeps track of whether it is executed, but it's also counting how often it is actually taken. And now doing this in a very precise way would be pretty expensive because you would have to store um, a different number um, for every edge. What the um, instrumentation of AFL is actually doing is to use um, buckets of increasing size and it approximates counts by just keeping track of in which bucket um, the particular edge is. So these buckets are um, 
uh, defined as you see here. So one, two, and three are um, kept separately. And then all counts between four and seven are in one bucket, all counts between eight and 15 are in another bucket. And these buckets are getting larger and larger so that basically the difference between the buckets um, are getting less and less important as the number of, uh, as the hit counts are getting larger. And the reason um, why this increasing bucket size makes sense is that um, the um, fuzzer wants to focus on only relevant differences in the hit counts. And um, it usually is more relevant whether a statement is executed once or twice than whether a statement is executed, say, um, um, yeah, 23 or 24 times. Because if you have executed a loop anyway very often, it doesn't matter whether you execute it another time. But the fact whether you do execute a loop only once or twice or maybe three times, um, that may be more important. All right, so now that you know how AFL measures coverage, let's have a look at how it uses all this information to maintain and evolve this queue of um, test inputs. So the, um, as you've seen on the overview um, figure, um, AFL is maintaining this queue of inputs. And initially, this queue only contains the set of seed inputs that are provided by the user or if none of these seed inputs is actually provided, it will start by filling it with a few random inputs. Now, once an input has been used, it is only kept in this queue if it has covered some new edge. That means if we have generated a new input and it doesn't reveal anything new, um, it will immediately be discarded because there's no need really to run this kind of input again. And then of course, we also need to put something back into this queue, otherwise it would um, pretty quickly be empty. And this is done by mutating the existing inputs that are considered to be interesting because they have covered something new. And then new inputs are generated based on those interesting inputs by mutating them automatically. We'll see on the next slide how this mutation um, typically looks like. Um, just to give you a feeling for how large these queues are getting. So if um, yeah, standalone programs of reasonable size are tested, then typically the queue sizes are between 1,000 and 10,000. So there is a significant number of inputs in this queue, but it sort of tends to uh, remain at, um, at a size that is still manageable. Let's now have a look at the mutation operators that AFL is using to generate new inputs from those inputs that are considered to be interesting. And this is done um, through a set of uh, mutation operators that are basically random transformations that are applied to the inputs. AFL considers the input of a program to be just a plain sequence of bytes, so it doesn't really know anything about the structure of these inputs or about what these bytes are meaning, and all the mutations are done on the byte level by mutating one or more of these bytes in some way. So here's um, a subset of the um, mutation operators that AFL is using, and this is actually uh, an easy extension point where you can improve the fuzzer by just adding more mutation operators. Um, one of these operators are bit flips. So it's basically yeah, flipping bits um, and not just once, but um, with varying length and also step over. So it may, for example, flip three bits, then have a step over of five. So leave the next five bits as they are, and then flip another three bits and maybe do this repeatedly in order to try to hopefully get some interesting patterns. Um, another mutation operator is about um, addition and subtraction of small integers. So um, it just looks at some of these bytes as integer numbers and then adds and removes um, some um, other, yeah, some um, uh, integers from these numbers. Another um, mutation operator is the insertion of interesting integers. So um, it focuses here on integers that are known to be interesting, for example, zero and one, or maybe the maximum integer, simply because um, um, these extreme values often trigger bugs. So, for example, because we have um, some off by one error somewhere or some boundary condition is not really correctly checked by the program. And then yet another um, mutation operator is splicing, which essentially means that two inputs are combined by taking the beginning of one input and the end of, the, of another input and then putting those um, two pieces together in order to get a new input, which sometimes may lead to something interesting. Of course, if you think about structured input formats, it could also lead to just garbage input that is not considered legal by the program, but at least sometimes it, it'll work. And because this whole idea of fuzzing is based on trying out many different inputs, um, even if it does not always work, um, it's still worth trying. So we've covered the basic idea of AFL now. And um, before um, concluding this, 
video, I just want to mention a few more tricks that people have worked on for uh, improving the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of an AFL-like fuzzer. Um, there are many, many um, papers that have been written and also many, many um, variants of this AFL tool that people have implemented by now. So this is just a small subset of possible tricks that you can play to, um, to fuzz faster and more efficiently and more effectively also. Um, but, but those are three that I just like to mention here. So one of them um, is to use time and memory limits for the executions. The idea here is that if you happen to generate an input that for whatever reason takes a lot longer than um, most inputs of this program um, take, then this kind of input will slow down your, your entire fuzzing um, process without really um, providing a lot of benefit. And the idea here is to discard an input whenever the execution is too expensive. So when it runs for more than some predefined time or when it takes more memory than um, some, some amount of memory that is predefined, then the program execution is just interrupted and this input is discarded immediately. Another trick is about um, periodically pruning this input queue by selecting a subset of the inputs that are currently in the queue that still covers every edge that we have seen so far. So by evolving this queue of test inputs, what may happen is that there may be different inputs in the queue that actually cover the same edges, um, but that because of the way um, this queue has evolved, just happen to be in, in the queue. And by periodically removing these redundant inputs, um, the queue stays not only smaller, but also more focused um, on, on new interesting behaviors. And then a third line of work is about um, priori prioritizing how many mutants to generate from a specific input that is taken from the queue. So in the algorithm, as I've explained it so far, um, AFL is always just taking one of the inputs from the queue and then applies some fixed number of mutations on this input. But actually what you can do is to somehow estimate how interesting this input is and how many mutants we should generate for this input. And um, by doing this, we can control um, on which inputs AFL is putting um, yeah, more, more effort um, and in this way um, um, help AFL to reach interesting behavior faster. So for example, one way to do this is to focus on unusual paths that are um, triggered by an input and to fuss this input more, so to generate more mutants from an input that has um, executed an unusual path hoping that when you have executed an unusual path, there may be more code behind this path that you would like to cover and that you could possibly cover by mutating this specific input um, even more than you mutate others. Finally, let me close this by quickly mentioning some of the real-world impact that AFL and Greybox fuzzing in general um, have already had uh, in practice. So AFL was initially developed by a single person as uh, an open source tool. And because it was uh, surprisingly effective, despite the fact that it's relatively simple at revealing security critical bugs, um, um, a whole team at Google is now working on this tool. It's still open source and various improvements have now been proposed um, by different companies, including Google, but also others, and also by various people in academia who have actively worked on fuzzing over the past few years. Um, now, this, the, the resulting fuzzers, which are all basically AFL-style fuzzers, but there are many different variants by now, um, are actually regularly used to check various security-critical components. And by now, not only have burned thousands of compute hours, but also have discovered hundreds of um, security um, vulnerabilities, which otherwise would have enabled some attackers to exploit some really important systems, but fortunately um, have been found um, through this further further before um, other people could take advantage of it. All right, and this is already the end of the third video in this lecture on random testing and fast testing. Um, I hope you now have a better idea of what random testing could um, actually achieve. So it's not just about uh, passing purely random inputs into a program and hoping that something interesting happens, but typically there's some kind of feedback mechanism that helps the random test generator to generate better inputs. Um, this feedback can come in different forms. Um, and in this last lecture, or this last video of the lecture, we've seen one form um, where uh, coverage feedback is used to um, generate new inputs that hopefully trigger new behaviors um, quickly. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time.